of our campuses into the service today. Those of you at the 288 campus, the Friendswood campus, the Alvin campus, the Webster campus, the Pearland campus, those of you at Weibo Bible Church in Weibo, Montana, and of course all of you watching online. My name is John. I'm part of the executive team, and we are so excited to have each and every one of you in church today. You guys excited to be in church today? Well, if uh, you are just joining us, this is week two of a lesson series that we are calling Until the Day. That is the title of our service. Uh, Basically, what we're doing through this series is we are uh, making our way through two New Testament books that would be the books of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Now, last week, Pastor Mike did a great job of introducing the series. Today, we're going to pick up where he left off in 1st Thessalonians chapter 2. So if you got your Bible or if you have your digital listening guide, you may want to go ahead and get that ready. Uh, By the way, the title for this lesson until the day is actually a reference to the second coming of Jesus. We, we believe that just as Jesus ascended into heaven 2,000 years ago, uh, one day he is going to come back from heaven, at which point every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. We are excited for that day. Uh, but just to be clear, although 1 Thessalonians mentions the second coming, 1 Thessalonians is not necessarily a book about the end times, okay? Just want to set fair expectations. Instead, it's really a book about how to live for Christ until the day he returns. And so with that in mind, I want to talk about where we have been and what we've learned about 1 Thessalonians so far, okay? Last week, we learned that the Apostle Paul actually established the church in Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. Thessalonica was located on a major your trade route. And so it makes sense that Paul would go there. It makes sense that Paul would want to plant a church there. But we also discovered that the start of this new church was nothing short of miraculous. And the reason I say that is because in just three short weeks, Paul was able to establish a brand new church of Jesus followers, which if you know anything about church growth is highly unusual. Normally, it takes months of planning, it takes months of prayer and preparation before a new church or a new campus can open, and yet Paul was able to do it in 21 days. Unfortunately, uh, soon after this church was started, opposition came against Paul, and this opposition actually forced Paul out of the city of Thessalonica. But even in Paul's absence, not only was this new church able to survive, Scripture tells us that this new church actually thrived. In fact, Paul starts his letter by explaining how these brand new baby Christians became an inspiration to the rest of the church world. And so I want to start today by looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. This is going to give you a picture of what uh, it was like for these new believers in Thessalonica. Paul writes this in verses 6 and 7, and you, this is the believers in the church of Thessalonica, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Now, when Paul writes the letter to the Thessalonians, it's only been about one year since uh, he was run out of town. But, but even in that short period of time, just over that one year uh, uh, period, Paul tells us that all the churches in that region had heard about their faith, that all of the churches in that region were encouraged because they had become an example to everyone else. So, so how did that happen? I mean, I mean, how was Paul able to start a church from scratch in only three weeks? More importantly, how did this little church gain such a large reputation despite suffering a so early in their church history. Well, I'll tell you how. We just read it in the text. They were able to do it because they received the word. It it happened because they had the power of God's word among them. You, You see, the people of Thessalonica were so gripped by the truth of God's word or the power of Paul's preaching that it changed everything about their lives. They, they, they stopped worshiping idols and they began to worship the one true God. They, they stopped uh, t- 
from, from pursuing things that, that were just all about them. And, and all of a sudden, they begin to try and serve the people in their community. More importantly, they begin to live with the expectation that Jesus really is going to return someday. All because they received the word. And just so you know, here at New Hope Church, we believe that the same word that Paul preached back then has the same power to change lives today. Now, I've entitled today's message, The Word Works, and that title actually got me to thinking about the fact that all of us have a starting point with the Word. All of us have a time in our life, a moment in our life when we're introduced to the Bible. Now, some of you grew up with the Bible. Uh, some of you have only just recently discovered the Bible. Some of you might be at one of our campuses or watching online, and, and, and today may be the first time you've heard about the Bible, and so this is your starting point. But, but sooner or later, all of us have a starting point with the Bible. And for me, it started when I was very, very young. Uh, my parents were in ministry, my, my dad was a pastor, and even though I personally didn't understand everything about this book, one thing I did understand about the Bible is that it was an important book. It was an important book. I, I knew it was important because my parents uh, taught me to treat this book with high regard and, and much respect. For, for, for example, I wasn't allowed uh, to take this book, to take my Bible and just throw it on the floor of my bedroom when I got home from church. Uh, I was not allowed to uh, sit on this book. I was not allowed to stand on this book. I was not allowed to use this book to build ramps for my Hot Wheels in my bedroom. Okay, wasn't allowed to do that. I uh, wasn't allowed to put magazines or newspapers or anything else on top of this book. The Bible always had to go on top. And I certainly was not allowed to put a cup on top of this book and, and use it like a coaster, okay? That was not happening at my house. And so I grew up understanding that this is an important book that needs to be respected and treated with high, high regard. Later on, I discovered the Bible is a popular book, and many of you know this already, but the Bible is actually the best-selling book ever of all time, and it's the best-selling book in the world. Uh, revenue from Bible sales tops $430 million every single year, and every single day, over 168,000 copies of the Bible are sold or given away. What's interesting to me about that is uh, even though the Bible is the best-selling book of all time, it's also the most shoplifted book of all time. <laughs> and I'm not really even sure how God feels about that, <laughs> you know, because uh, on the one hand, God wants everybody to have a Bible, right? On the other hand, uh, stealing is one of the thou shalt nots found in the Ten Commandments, right? Uh, but you wouldn't know that unless you had a Bible. So, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know. I guess we'll let God <laughs> figure that piece out, right? Uh, and besides, I mean, the Gideons give away Bibles. I don't know why you can just go to a hotel and get one for free that way. You don't have to shoplift the Bible, okay? But... Uh, well, what, what, whatever. Once I got to college, I learned that the Bible is a very wordy book. Uh, in fact, there are over 773,000 words in the Bible. It, it takes the average reader about 70 hours to get through the Bible from cover to cover. Uh, if you read 10 minutes every single day, you could get through the entire Bible in one year. Uh, but speaking of words, words that are found in the Bible, um, the, the word dog, I find it interesting. The word dog is mentioned 13 times. 13 times. You'll find the word dog in the Bible. Care, care to guess how many times you find the word cat mentioned in the Bible? Zero times. Zero times, okay? <laughs> zero times. Dog, 13. Cat, zero. Now, you can draw whatever conclusions you want to from that. But let me just say at the Davis house, uh, we, we don't have any cats at the Davis house, okay? Uh, we, we believe that God is pro-dog at the Davis house, all right? <laughs> well, uh, regardless of your pet preference... What really sets the Bible apart is the fact that the Bible is God's book. It's, it's God's book. We, we believe that the Bible is not like any other book in the world because it was not created by anyone from this world. Yet, yes, the Bible was written by 40 different authors, but really there's only one author, which is why 420 times in the King James Version of the Bible, you will find the phrase, thus saith the Lord. In other words, this is not just a book about God. This is a book from God. 
And, and this is so important for us because if you were to ask 20 different people what they think about the Bible, chances are good you're going to get 20 different answers. So some people might say, well, it's a, it's a really old book, right? It's a really ancient book. Others might say, well, I know it's a religious book. Some people might say, well, it's just a storybook filled with fables and, and myths. But we believe what sets this book apart from any other book is the fact that it is the inspired, infallible, authoritative word of God. And if that is true, which I believe that it is, then we are left with one very important question. Here it is. What will you do with this book? What, what will you do with the Bible. And in fact, this was the question that Paul issued to the Thessalonians uh, from the day that Paul arrived at Thessalonica. He did nothing but share the gospel with people and then wait for them to respond, which brings us to our key text. We're going to pick up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to start with verses 1 and 2. It says this, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. In other words, it was not empty. It was not purposeless. Instead, it had meaning. It had purpose. It was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Now, this word, the gospel, it, it, it means the good news. And, and, and the good news or the gospel, it's synonymous with the word or with the scriptures. It's synonymous with the Bible. And, and the reason the gospel is good news is because it tells us how we can be saved through the work of Jesus on the cross. And so Paul is actually writing this letter to a group of people who have accepted the good news. They've, they've received the good news. And, and, and Paul's writing to them. He's saying, here's how you need to live your life until the day that Jesus returns. But that's not the only reason that Paul is writing this letter. You see, Paul is writing this letter because he's got some haters in Thessalonica. A anybody got some haters in, in your life? Well, Paul, Paul had some haters at Thessalonica. In fact, the reason that he had to leave Thessalonica after just three weeks is because his life was in danger, okay? The religious leaders heard about what he was doing. They came after him. They wanted to throw him in jail or worse. He found out about this and he says, I'm, I'm out of here. And so he slips out in the middle of the night. Now, what's crazy about that is this is typical for Paul's life. This is like par for the course for Paul. In fact, the city that he just came out of, the city of Philippi, the same thing happened there. Uh, uh, he got thrown in jail. He was actually beaten. Ev eventually, he was able to escape. And so though he, he goes to Thessalonica to share the gospel there. Now, I don't know about you, but if it's me, if I'm Paul, and, and I get beaten and thrown in jail at one place, and I might, I might think twice. I might think twice about the next city that I was going to go to. That's just me. I might think twice about that, but, but not Paul, not Paul. In fact, Paul just got bolder in his faith. It seemed like the worse things got, the more confident Paul got, the more, the more, you know, the more that he just wanted to share the gospel. And, and so he gets bolder and bolder. He goes to Thessalonica. Same thing happens there. Gets kicked out. Sadly, after being driven out of Thessalonica, Paul's adversaries, you know, in his absence, Paul's adversaries, they, they're like, well, we know that Paul has already got this church going, and so we're going to try and discredit the work that he's done by attacking his character. And, and, and they did this by, by starting three rumors about Paul. And they hoped that these rumors would, would kind of cause his, his new band of Jesus followers to break up. But of course, when Paul hears about these rumors, he decides to write this letter and refute those false accusations. So what were the rumors? What were the rumors that got started about Paul? Well, let me show them to you. Put them on the screen right here. Uh, this is what they said about Paul. They said his message was a lie. They said he didn't care about the people. And they said he was only there for the money. But by the way, I, I think it's so interesting that these three accusations against Paul. When, when people are critical today, what do they say about the church? What do they say about pastors? They say this kind of stuff right here. The pastor's message is a lie. The pastor doesn't care about people. The pastor's only interested in the Benjamins. These are the kind of things that people who are against the church or against pastors, they may say these kind of things. And, and every once in a while, this is true. But, but let me tell you something. N none of the pastors that, pastors that I know are that way and, and, and Paul was definitely not that way. 
And so starting in the next two verses, Paul begins to address these rumors one at a time. And, and, and he, he kind of shares with us from his heart what he's thinking about each one of them. And so we're going to look at all of these together. But what was the first, first rumor? That his message was a lie. His message was a lie. So what does Paul say about that? Well, starting in verse 3, it says this. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to what? Deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the what? Gospel. So we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. Now, a big part of Paul's evangelistic strategy for any city that he would go into was very, very simple. The first thing that he would do was go to the Jewish synagogue, and he would be telling Jewish folks about who Jesus was and what Jesus came to do. Of course, once the Jewish people stopped listening to Paul, he would then turn his attention to the Gentiles, and he would begin to tell them who Jesus was and what Jesus came to do. But regardless of which people group he was talking to, he always had the same strategy. What he would do is he would tell people about who Jesus was and what Jesus came to do, and he would do it using the Old Testament scriptures. He would do it using the law. And so this is important because what it tells us is that, that Paul's not, he's not presenting a new idea. Okay, he's not presenting a new teaching. This was actually an old idea that he's showing from the Old Testament law, but the Jewish people would reject it. Of course, because they didn't want to accept it, it was just easier to call Paul a liar. But Paul said, no, no, no I didn't come to deceive anybody. You, you guys knew exactly what I was teaching. You know exactly which, which book I was teaching from. This wasn't a new message. This wasn't a lie. And besides, God knows our hearts, and so I don't have to explain myself to any of you. Then in verse 8, Paul begins to address the second rumor. What was the second rumor? He didn't, he didn't care. He just didn't care about people. And this is what he writes in verse 8 of 1 Thessalonians. It says, Our affection for you was so great that we were determined to what? Share with you not only the what? Gospel of God, but also our very lives because you had become so dear to us. Now this is such a powerful verse that we find in Scripture because it tells us what happens when the people of God who are filled with the Word of God get together. When the people of God who are filled by the Word of God get together, they begin to share their lives. They begin to get closer to one another. They begin looking out for one another, praying for one another, encouraging one another. And even though Paul was not in Thessalonica long, the truth is you can build strong bonds with people in a short amount of time when you have something in common with them. And so Paul had the gospel in common with them. Paul had Jesus in common with them. Paul, Paul had affliction in common with them. And so they became very, very close in a very short period of time. I know that I have experienced this myself in my own life group. I've got a men's life group that meets on Wednesday mornings. Uh, we we uh, have only been meeting for a few weeks. A new life group semester has begun, so we've only been meeting for a few weeks. And um, even though it's only been a short period of time, I, I can just sense that we're already starting to connect. We're already starting to bond. So why is that? Well, it's because when the people of God get together to study the Word of God, something just happens. You just get closer together. And I've already told these guys. In fact, I told them this week. My prayer is that we would get closer together the more time that we spend together so we can help each other become the people that God wants us to be. And so Paul says, hey, when I was spending time with you guys, you were very dear to me to the point that I shared my life with you. Then in verse 9, Paul addresses the third rumor. Anybody remember what the third rumor was? Oh, money. That's right. Paul's just in it for the Benjamins. That's it. So this is what he says in verse 9. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Now, if you don't know this about Paul, Paul was a tent maker by trade, which was a valuable skill to have back in the first century. What that meant is he could go into any city and get a job. It also meant because he could get a job, he could take care of himself financially. And so he writes this group of people just to remind them, hey, hey, you guys remember I worked night and day. Okay, I was working all the time. I was working on church stuff during the day, working on tents at night. Why? So that I wouldn't be a burden to anybody. Now, Paul addresses all three of these rumors. And as a general rule, I, I never think it's a good idea to respond to critics. 
Okay, never think it's a good idea to respond to your critics, especially uh, on social media. That's, that's not good, okay, not good. But in this case, Paul does choose to respond. So why does he do that? Well, he's not necessarily responding to his critics. He's responding to those who are closest to him who've been influenced by his critics. Make sense? And he did leave kind of quickly in the middle of the night And so Paul did understand that people probably did have some hurt feelings. He probably did need to explain some things. And so he's writing to them, and he's trying to smooth some things out with them, which, by the way, that's what you do with people who are close to you. You you sit down and you talk things out. So he's doing a little bit of that. But I also think that Paul is trying to make a point with his audience. So what, what point is Paul trying to make? by addressing his critics. Well, well, did anyone notice the one phrase that Paul repeated in every response? I'll, I'll give you a hint. I had you guys say it in two of the verses. What, what was the phrase that Paul repeated in every response? The gospel, the gospel. Let's all say that on, on the count of three at all of our campuses. One, two, three. The gospel. Yeah, so why would he bring that up? What's that all about? Well, I believe that Paul was reminding his audience the most important gift that he could give them was not his time. Instead, it was God's word. Would he have liked to have stayed longer? Yes. Would he have liked to have discipled these people like, like he did other churches in other cities? Absolutely, he would have. But Paul said, hey, I was only with you for a short time, but my time was not in vain because I believe Paul understood a very important truth about spiritual growth. And here was the truth that Paul understood. Paul understood that preachers don't change people. The gospel changes people. Paul understood churches don't change people. It's the gospel that changes people. Now, don't get me wrong. We need good pastors. We need good churches who aren't afraid to teach the gospel, aren't afraid to teach the Bible. But Paul understood even if he could not be present with them, he was giving them something better than himself. He was giving them the eternal word of God. In fact, fact, check out what Paul writes next. This is verse 13. Paul writes, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at what? Work in you who believe. Now, now Paul believed in the power of God's word because it changed his life. On, On the road to the Damascus, at the beginning of his ministry, he met Jesus, who is the word. And when he met Jesus, Jesus changed everything. Jesus changed Paul's perspective. Jesus changed Paul's purpose. Jesus completely changed Paul's life. And as a result, Paul was willing to risk his life so that other people might know the truth about Jesus. And praise God, the church in Thessalonica, they not only They not only received what Paul shared with them, but they accepted it. In other words, they not only heard it with their ears, but they believed it in their hearts. So much so that they became an example for others to follow. And let me just say this, God's word can do the same for you. God's word can do the same for me. God's God's word can transform your life in such a way that you become an example to the people around you. You can become an example to your family. You can become an example to the people at your job. You can become an example to the people in your community. You, You can make a difference in this world, but you have to let God's word work in you. And so for the remainder of our time, what I want to do is I want to get real practical. I want to share with you two ways that God's Word works in us. Two ways that God's Word works in us. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. First of all, God's Word works in us the more we love God's Word. The more we we love God's Word. Listen to what Scripture teaches in Psalm 119. This is verses 97 and 98. It says, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. You you know what happens when you love something? I mean, when you really love something. You know what you you do? You have a tendency to do that thing over and over and over and over again. It could be working out, could be going to the movies, could be riding motorcycles, who, who knows whatever your thing is. But when you love something, you just do it over and over again. For me, it's ice cream. Okay, just, I, 
I love ice cream. Uh, trust me, nobody has to tell me to eat ice cream because I, you know, I, I love it. I got ice cream at my house. I eat ice cream almost every day. It doesn't matter if it's summer, winter, fall, or spring. I'm all about the ice cream. I lo love me some ice cream. And nobody has to tell me to eat it because I love it. Well, the way I feel about ice cream is the way the psalmist says he feels about God's word. And because he loves God's word, you know what he writes? I meditate. I, I meditate on it all day long. Now, it may be hard for some of you to imagine that you could ever love reading the Bible, but the truth is we read the Bible because we love the author. We, we don't read the Bible because we necessarily love reading. We read the Bible because we, we love the author of the Bible. You see, the Bible is God's way that he communicates with us. When we pray, we are talking to God. When we read scripture, it is God talking to us. And so anytime we open up this book, it's an opportunity to draw closer to him. And, and according to scripture, we, we, we don't just read God's word. What do we do? We meditate. We meditate on God's word. So, so what does that mean? What's the difference between reading and Meditating. Well, reading is something we do in a few minutes. Meditating is something that we do all day long. Reading is something that we do when we want to get through the words on the pages. Meditating is something that we do when we want to get the words on the pages through us. And, and the best way I can illustrate this is by talking about hot tea. So by show of hands, all of our campuses, how many of you have ever made hot tea before? Anybody? Uh, okay, very good. Hands going up everywhere. Very good. My mom's a tea drinker. She drinks lots of hot tea. Uh, not me so much. But uh, here's what I know about uh, making hot tea. To make hot tea, you need three things. You need uh, hot water, you need tea leaves, and then you need to leave the tea leaves in the water, right? That's, that's, what, that's how you make hot tea. Well, uh, uh, reading, reading would be like if I took the tea leaves and I just dipped it into the water real fast and immediately took it out. That would be reading, in and out. Now, some tea gets in, but basically, what do you still got there? Just, just hot water, not very tasty, not very good, okay? Meditating, meditating different. It's different. How's it different? We put the tea leaves in and we leave them there. Leave them there. Now, the technical word for this is steeping, steeping. Uh, I did not know this because I'm more of a coffee guy, okay? But apparently, uh, the perfect cup of hot tea is made when you allow the tea leaves to steep for about four to five minutes, four to five minutes. In other words, it takes time to make hot tea. Well, in a similar way, meditation takes time. Uh, meditation is when I slow down and really think about what I've read. Meditation happens when I, I turn a passage over and over again in my mind and really let it get down inside of me. And here's why it matters so much. You see, the more that we can get God's word in us, the more we start to look like God. The, the more time I can meditate on the word of God, the more I start taking on the character traits of God, like like. like tea. The, the water gets darker and darker. Same, same thing. The more I'm in God's word, the more I start to look like God. Now, now I know that this is a tough one for a lot of people be, because chances are good. Many of you in the room, many of you at our campuses or online, you, you've tried this, okay? You've tried to read the Bible before and you've been nothing but frustrated. And if that's you, I totally get it uh, because for years I would read the Bible and I would be frustrated when I would read the Bible. That is until I figured out the secret to hear from God every time I open up God's word. And, and this is like a, a Bible reading hack that I'm about to give you, okay? So this is the secret to hearing from God every time you open up his word. The secret is you got to know what questions to ask. You got to know what questions to ask. Isn't that what communication is in, anyway? I'm asking questions and I'm receiving answers. That's that's what that's how we hear from God. We got to know what questions to ask the Bible. So what questions should we ask? Well, I ask the same four questions every time I open God's God's word. I'm going to give those four questions to you. Here they are on the screen. Every time I read, same four questions. First I ask, what does this passage say about God, Jesus or the Holy Spirit? Second, second question I ask is, what does this passage say about people, life, or faith? Third question I ask, how does this truth relate to my life? Then the fourth question I ask, how can I practice this truth 
today. These are the same four questions I ask every single day when I open up God's Word and ask Him to speak to me. I'm asking these questions. Now, the reason I start with this question, what does this passage say about God, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, is because the Bible is God's book. It's, it's all about Him. And I can't really understand who I am or my place in this life until I understand who He is anyway. So it's really important that we start with that question first. What is, what is God revealing to me about Himself from his word, and he, he reveals incredible things. The second question, what does this passage say about people, life, or faith? This is really important because I'm a person, I'm living life, and I'm trying to grow in my faith. You with me? The Bible says a lot about those three things. I promise if you'll just ask that question, be like, whoa, there's a whole lot in here about, about uh, my, my life and, and about my faith. And then I ask these last two questions because these are application questions. Um, Remember, we're not, we're not just reading the Bible to get information, although you do get information, but that's not why we're necessarily, we're reading it for transformation. We want to become more like the people that God wants us to be. We want to, we want to represent God well and Christ well on this earth. And so these, these questions right here just help me to take the truth that I'm learning and apply them into my everyday life. Now, now, all of this is so, so very important for, for all of us. But the cool part is the more you do this, the more you hear from God, the more, the more he reveals himself, the more you apply his word to your life and you become more like his son, Jesus, as you start to see those changes, you're going to fall more and more in love with God's word. You're going to want to spend time in his word. You're going to want to hear from him. You're going to look forward to every morning opening this book for just a few minutes and meditating on, on his word. So that's, that's point number one. God works as we love his word. That does lead us to point number two. Here it is. God's word works in us the more we live God's word. First, we've got to love God's word. Then we've got to live God's word. Now let's go back to Psalm 119. This time we're going to pick up in verses 9 and 11. It says this, How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You, you want to know how to live for God? Hide God's word in your heart. Now, throughout Scripture, we find uh, all kinds of metaphors uh, used to describe God's word. These are powerful word pictures that helps us to understand God's word and how it relates to us. Uh, there, there are verses that tell us that God's word is like a lamp that lights up our path. There are verses that tell us that God's word is like a seed that gets planted in our hearts and then bears fruit in our life. There are verses that tell us that God's word is like a sword that divides soul and spirit. There are verses that tell us that God's word is like a fire that consumes every evil thing. But my favorite metaphor can be found in Jeremiah 23, where God declares that his word is like a hammer that breaks rocks into pieces. And I don't know about you, but there are seasons in my life when I need the hammer of God's word to break up some things in my soul, in my, in my heart, in my mind, and in my attitude. Maybe, maybe you can relate to that. For you, it might come late at night when worry grips your soul, when you can't get to sleep and you're just turning through the events of the next day, when, when you're just worried and anxious. But in that moment, you can live by the promises of God which say, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. There, there may be times in your life when you're afraid, when you're, you're not sure what's happening in the world and you're gripped with fear but in that moment, you can live the promises of God's word that say God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-discipline. For you, there may be a, a moment in your life when you feel like quitting. It could be something that God's called you to do. It could be a relationship. But in that moment, you need to know that you can live the promises of God's word that say do not become weary in doing good because at the proper time, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. There might be a time when you battle temptation. But you need to know that in that moment, you can 
You can live the power of the promises of God, which say no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you may endure it. Or or maybe for you, there'll be a season when your faith just feels like it's all beat up. and You're not sure what to do. Maybe you're struggling with doubts. And in that moment, you can live by the promise of God's word that says, I wait quietly before the Lord for my victory comes from him. For he alone is my rock, my salvation, my fortress where I will never be shaken. I don't know what it is for you, what it will be when that moment will come, but I can promise you that if you will choose to hide God's word in your heart, you'll begin to live God's word in your life and God's word will begin to work in you. Now earlier I said all of us when we get introduced to this book have to answer one very important question and that is what will we do with this book? What what will we do with this book? And it's important because only one book has the power to change your life. Only one book reveals to us who God is and only one book offers the way to salvation through Jesus. It's this book right here. And my prayer is for each and every one of us that we would be people who love God's word and live God's word. This time I want to invite our campus pastors to the stage. We're going to take communion together as a church family across all of our campuses. And so if we have volunteers uh, at any of our campuses uh, who have communion cups, maybe now would be a good time to start making your way around the auditoriums. If you need a communion cup, go ahead and raise your hand. But let me go ahead and turn it over to our campus pastors at all of our campuses.